So um, I'm going to talk about human factors and awareness. Um, human factors is generally in most um, large reports now. It's something that we should be paying attention to. It's usually at the fag end of the report, uh, and unfortunately it is towards the end of the NAP5 report. It's just where it, where it sits. It's one of those summary chapters, but I think it's worth paying attention to. I hope it is. Um, I was uh, ably assisted or told what to do by um, my colleagues here, and of course, by, as I said, it's a, it's a joint work by the whole panel. Um, so in its simplest, the immediate cause of awareness is failure to give enough anaesthetic. But there are often numerous contributory factors that increase or even cause the administration of insufficient anaesthetic. I was uh, speaking to a chap earlier um, uh, at an interview where he said, this anaesthetic awareness should be a never event. You anaesthetists have got to know you should just be giving more anaesthetic. And the focus is on the end user, on the person who has undoubtedly, in cases of awareness, not given enough anaesthetic. But it is worth looking around that subject and seeing if there's anything that goes on. Because I'm going to run out of time, I'm going to start with my key points and then tell you what the recommendations are so I can sit down at any point. So nap, um, all NAPs un un uh, likely underestimate the impact of human factors. They're designed to do so. Human factors um, was, were highly prevalent in NAP5 cases. Institutional human factors were notable as contributors to, what in, to, to then individuals leading to awareness. Um, and in, we, we believe that investigation of cases of awareness should include uh, some sort of analysis of human factors and their impact. Our recommendations, uh, I think, are only two for this, that all anaesthetists should be educated in human factors so they can understand their potential impact on patient care and environments, etc., etc., etc. Um, and the investigation and responses to uh, episodes of awareness, especially those involving drug error, uh, drug slips and mishaps, should consider not only the action errors uh, that come at the end, but also the broader threats and latent factors. What is human factors? In a word, ergonomics. In 22 words, uh, it's encompassing, it encompasses all those factors that can influence people, their behaviour, in, in a work context, the environment, organisational job factors, individual characteristics which influence behaviour. It's the stuff around us. So we have designed, this is a quote from the report, NAP5 has been designed in a way that almost inevitably misses much of the HF contributory. A human factors is uh, on the agenda. So the human factors in healthcare concordat from the National Quality Board came out, I think, uh, earlier this year. Um, and it's uh, coming together uh, uh, partly driven by the Clinical Human Factors Group and uh, their, their pressure that they've, that they've applied very effectively uh, following these principles to embed it in everything that we do in, in medical education and, and medical practice. And it's been survived, signed by this worthy, worthy bunch of organisations uh, and a few others. So it, it's coming to the fore. Uh, NAPs and human factors, well, we use the wrong methodology to identify um, uh, human factors. We ask people to send us a written account. We ask one person to send us a written account of their interpretation of what happened, which we then ask them to type into a computer. And it's not a very good way of detecting, with no, without necessarily um, asking the right questions. Um, so after NAP4, and I'm not going to talk about NAP4 in any great depth, we did a study where, uh, in collaboration with the University of Aberdeen, um, uh, Rona Flynn and other psychologists um, spoke to 12 people who'd reported cases to, to NAP4 and used a human factors investigation tool to try and explore the human factors contribution. So our findings in NAP4 in the report, 40% of reports, um, included human factors co contributions. And in, and in tw and a quarter of them, they were important. After these 12 cases, 100% of those cases involved human factors, and the average was, was around five um, human factor issues. So we're missing them all. So whatever I now tell you about human factors in NAP5, it, we've missed a lot of it. Um, there are various ways of classifying uh, human factors or analysing human factors. I'll, I'll, I'll dwell on those just briefly. So uh, Reason, one of those sort of daddies of human factors, he talks about errors, divides them into slips, lapses, trips, fumbles, and then mistakes. The slips and lapses can be further uh, classified into recognition, attention, or memory, and selection failures, typical things psychologists uh, tend to talk about. Um, but the, perhaps the most useful um, classification, the active failures of healthcare professionals, the end user bit, and then the latent organisational failures. I'm not going to read that out, you can read it for yourself. Who's made a routine violation? Who's optimised a viol who's made an optimising violation? 
and who has been forced to use a necessary violation while working in the NHS in the 21st century. <laughs> but they're violations. And so we end up with reasons flow chart. So this is really, this is the Swiss cheese model put in uh, black and white in boxes rather than in a picture of cheese. A second model is the HFIT model, which is quietly, slightly difficult to explain and therefore I'm not going to bother. Um, but it's the model that we use to analyse uh, NAP4 um, and it involves classifying uh, th uh, situations as threats. Uh, the situation awareness is it's originally from industry, uh, for the high-risk industries, oil industry particularly, it was developed. So how threats and situation awareness lead to an action error and whether error recovery is, uh, is part of that, that. And there's a complicated uh, sort of subtypes, there's something like 300 different subtypes and classifications that the skilled, trained uh, operators will, will extract out of this that we can't do. There's then an evidence-based version um, done by Lawton, uh, which, is a, which I think is a really nice, I call it the, um, the sort of, uh, I can't remember what I call it, the onion skin uh, type um, investigation, where we have all these things around the active failure which may contribute to, to, to the actual event. And they're, they're divided out quite nicely into situation, situation or situational factors, local working conditions, latent organisational factors, and latent external factors. We use this after a disastrous case in Bath to analyse that case in detail, and we used, we used their classifications to try and identify and tease out exactly what had happened in this, what was a tragic case on ITU. We found it very useful, and if, um, that's been published if anyone wants to read about it how you do that. And then lastly, rather s perhaps simplistically, there's the MPSA classification of contributory factors um, to, um, uh, to, to which we can use. Let me see how we're going. Good. Um, so what about awareness and the, uh, and the human factors in the literature? So there are a number of large cohort studies, starting with Sandins in 2000, where um, there have been large prospectives, uh, observational studies, looking at cases of awareness and some of them have commented on human factors. So if, if we look at Sandin's paper, uh, there were uh, seven cases where uh, human factors uh, seem to be uh, cited or involved. Uh, there were two out of 19 which were uncertain, and, and 10 in which no cause could be found whatsoever, quite a high rate. So you could argue that they've reported a roughly 41% rate of human factors in their, in their study. You can compare that to Arando's, um, I think, slightly flawed um, uh, study from the BJA, um, I think they found a 1% uh, rate of, of awareness. Um, uh, they looked at 22 cases um, and found a rather, um, they found about 70% of them were, were attributed to human error, as they called it, which would translate to human factors. And then the largest study from America, Peter Siebel's um, uh, study, where they identified, I think it's 25 cases, uh, no causes were offered in any of them, in spite of describing the cases in great detail. So is that 0% human factors or is that no percent? And then if we dwell, if we go down into the much discussed um, Bryce studies, where we're the randomised controlled trials, where an intervention is, is used to try and um, reduce uh, the instance awareness to see if it reduces instance awareness, is frankly never mentioned. What do we find in that for? So using the MPSA classification, I've highlighted education and training, and that's been mentioned in some of the discussions. So that's, you'll also see the patient at 70% at, at of cases, um, quite, quite significant, and obviously medication at 78%. Medication perhaps should be 100%, but there were, there were particular reasons for, for, for putting medication in or out. But education and training, important, but actually compared to NAT4, there's this, there are contributory factors right across the board, organisational, strategic, task-related, team and social, work environment, they're all, they're all got significant contributory factors. Um, what about the quality of care? Uh, so did we judge that an East sister done a good job, um, sometimes, a mixed job or a poor job? Uh, quite a lot of the time we felt they'd either done a mixed job or a poor job. There were areas for improvement, put it like that. And 70% of the cases, these are, these are the, these are the the certain and probable cases, so the cases that we had the best data on, the 110 cases with the best data. So 70, 70 roughly, roughly three quarters of cases preventable, um, and good care prior to, prior to awareness in only a quarter of cases. So we've talked about mind the gap, that's a big human factors issue, that transfer of patients. For those hospitals who do anaesthetise their patients in theatre, we haven't anaesthetised patients in theatre for 15 years in Bath. Um, but there's a gap to mind, there's an obstetric gap to mind, do you remember to turn your anaesthetic agent on? Do you remember all sorts of things? Uh, does the 
mess uh, that's created in your workstation. This is a genuine picture, not doctored, um, from a uh, case I was doing, um, uh, <laughs> which was a tricky case, quite a busy day. Um, and um, does that contribute to uh, episodes of awareness? We identified quite a few, and I'm not going to read these slides out, but there are quite a few human factors that we identified um, in uh, induction, drug errors, mind the gap errors, inadequate dosing for various reasons, violations of, of some sort, um, ample labelling designs, errors of judgment and knowledge, etc., etc. Um, so lots and lots of different things that we teased out as induction. Um, and this has been mentioned before, the ABCDE checklist. It's a recommendation. Not all recommendations have to be implemented, but I think it's something that the specialty should consider very carefully. Um, uh, I think it's a potentially useful uh, checklist that may make differences. What about slips and lapses? Well, here you've got an action error. You've got somebody picking up the wrong syringe or labelling the wrong syringe and giving the wrong drug. Clearly, they're culpable, they've got everything wrong, they've made a massive mistake. In all of the 17 cases, 18 cases, all of 17 of which involved neuromuscular blockers, there were contributory factors outside the individual saying, I don't know what happened, I just picked up the wrong syringe. There were, there were other things going on. Um, and then in maintenance and emergence, a, a, a slightly smaller list of, 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 of uh, major factors, but we're in a, a, an area of greater stability, but those are the ones we teased out. Monitoring and emergence, well, 88% of emergence cases were judged to be preventable, so close on 90%. So uh, I think someone referred to it as JDEEP's triad, um, a holy triad. Yes, so um, not using muscle relaxant when you don't need to, if you're using the monitoring and using reversal appropriately. I think that's the triad. In the, in the, again, in the, in the project, because of the sake of time, I'm not going to read these out, but there's a whole list of, of human factors we tried to tease out and that the, that the um, local coordinator specifically stated to us about organisations um, and distraction, distraction born of rushing, perhaps. Um, does anybody in here not rush ever? Put your hand up. Um, so two case reports. You know, this is the sort of, sort of event that can happen. So just prior to induction, because of the history of reflux, the consultant changed the anaesthetic plan, which had been made by a, um, a, a what they called anaesthetic, anaesthetic practitioner, to include trachealine intubation. The consultant drew up the muscle relaxant and watched the assistant place the cannula. The cannula proved difficult. Uh, the consultant placed the atrium on the work surface, unlabeled, and helped with the, with the cannulation. You know where we're going. Uh, the error was promptly recognised in general analyses which was induced. Postoperative, the patient reported respiratory difficulty, paralysis, feeling of dread and death, post-traumatic stress disorder. But there's a few things happening there. While the senior trainee, this is, I'm not allowed, I, can't, I think I can say this is one of my favourites, but I think this is one of, the, one of the most, you just think, oh, you know, poor guy, poor everybody. Um, the senior trainee anaesthetist was waiting for the patient. The theatre coordinator changed the vaporiser for a new trial vaporiser without informing the anaesthetist. Meanwhile, the anaesthetist was called away to an emergency. On returning, they induced without a further machine check. Following the uneventful induction, they did a block, and then the heart rate went up, and signs of light anaesthesia supervened. Uh, eventually, they checked and found that the vaporiser, vaporizer, which was not their vaporiser, was empty. Awareness supervened. So, any human factor solutions? These are all discussed in the report. Can we create a better environment for ourselves to work in? Can we say, I won't accept that list? Can we say, I need time to draw up my drugs? Can we say, I won't be rushed in this way? Uh, can we as individuals plan better and as departments plan better? Does the checklist have a role? Uh, should we be demanding that we're not given drugs that are almost indistinguishable, that contain drugs that do different, that the amples of which contain drugs that do very different things? Can we embrace technology? That's part of human factors. Should we look again at scanning drugs? There are new machines that, that, that you can now press one single button on the, on, the, on, the, on the machine. It'll stop giving gas um, while you reposition the patient or whatever, but it'll only do it for a minute and a half or two minutes, and then it'll automatically turn everything back on again. And there are now anaesthetic machines. We now have these that, that servo control the entire anaesthetic agent um, level. So you dial in your 0.7 Mac, and, uh, and whatever you do, that will be delivered. And what about depth of anaesthesia, uh, monitoring and, and better communication? So all things to consider. And there we are, back to the recommendations. Thank you very much.